Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Gerard Toll and this is the fourth and final lecture on this book, Network Propaganda. And in this lecture, what I want to do is to summarize the key argument in the book about the asymmetric public sphere in the United States and the political polarization that's associated with it as the cause of the epistemic crisis that they begin the book with. Let's begin with this particular map, which is a, a map of the what they call the open web, and um, discuss it. Um, so the open web is their particular graphic illustration, their visualization of the web link economy during the 2016 election. And what's important about this is uh, you have to see the marked difference between the right and everything that is not right on this map. So there's a clear overlap and interaction between uh, the uh, center and uh, the, uh, this is the left of the map, this is the right, uh, but these kind of conservative um, journals here, like the uh, Wall Street Journal, ABC, The Hill, Reuters, and those, but those are center-right publications, and these are center, uh, and then these are uh, to the left. What's important is that there's one sphere here, and then separated from it, is the sphere on the right. And this is discussed by them on page 49, where they argue that um, the we see that the right part of the spectrum has Breitbart and Fox News as its base of attraction and has almost no overlap with the center and is sharply separated from the rest of the map. Now, that's the key point they want to make is that um, we can see in the architecture or the uh, particular structure of the public sphere and of uh, information sharing in the United States, we can see an asymmetrical structure. And it's a condition where you have a right-wing media ecosystem which is separated from the rest. And it's also separated from the norms that govern the rest. And the norms uh, are those of professional journalism with its corrective functions. This is the uh, reality uh, um, corrective process. So this is what they describe as an asymmetric media ecology. And it's linked to an asymmetric political polarization. We can see this in other maps that they document uh, throughout the book. Um, and the argument that they make uh, empirically by demonstrating these particular um, visualizations of linkages is that approximately one third of the US population, one third of uh, people who engage in the public sphere with news um, live in a filter bubble characterized by propaganda feedback loops. Um, so it is a, a filter which is separated from the reality that is shared and uh, experienced by the rest of the population. Now, this particular uh, ecosystem and the asymmetric qualities of it means that uh, one side, approximately one third of the population, is detached from the norms of truth-seeking in the US. So there's a willingness to amplify scandals and conspiracies. There's no check on those because everything is driven by partisan commitments uh, and by identity affirmation. So this makes this segment of the uh, media ecology overall much more susceptible to political clickbait fabricators, to, to Russian propaganda uh, and propaganda from, from other countries, and also to extremist, highly partisan uh, bullcrap, uh, such as we saw with the Pizzagate uh, scandal. Now, why do they use the term asymmetric? And what they mean here is that it, uh, the, and this is uh, described on page 97, it has an asymmetric shape 
Um, so in other words, there, uh, the US public sphere is not fully polarized into Democratic and Republican uh, spheres. Um, but instead, you just have a substantial portion of the Republicans uh, and self-identified conservatives who occupy a self-reinforcing bubble. And their sources of news, their trusted sources, are uh, sources which are political and propagandistic and highly partisan uh, as opposed to those that are committed to uh, norms of uh, journalistic professionalism, like the New York Times, like the Washington Post, li uh, like BBC uh, and, and elsewhere, where you have these processes uh, of checking uh, the degree to which uh, um, kind of false stories, disinformation, misinformation uh, gets into the public arena. Now, what this means is that, uh, as they lay it out on page 99, it is not the Republicans are more gullible or less rational than Democrats. It is not that technology has de destroyed all the possibility of shared discourse at all. Rather, it is the structure of the media ecology within which Republican voters, um, whether they're conservative or right-wing radicals on the one hand or Republican politicians on the other, find themselves. It's that structure that has made them particularly susceptible to misperception and manipulation, while the media ecology that Democrats and their supporters occupy exhibited structural features that are more robust uh, to propaganda efforts and offer more value, avenues for self-correction and self-healing. Um, so what does this mean overall? Well, this is the key argument that they make in the book. The epistemic crisis, the crisis uh, of fake news, the crisis of a uh, lack of assured reality. Um, the real cause, as far as they're concerned, is not many of the actors that uh, are sort of um, seen as problems du jour. The Russians, fake news uh, entrepreneurs, Cambridge Analytica, Facebook, Google, um, or even uh, symmetrical partisan echo chambers. No, instead that they argue um, that the technological dynamics here are less important, that we should not overly focus on the technology. It comes back to a larger uh, argument they're making throughout the book than I, and I uh, emphasized in the other lectures, structures. They're interested in structures and structures of power. And so therefore they highlight the long-term dynamics of political economy ideology and institutions interacting with technological uh, adoption and the affordances provided by techno new technological structures and uh, new technological um, capacities, that that is the primary driver of the present epistemic crisis. It's the ideology and in institutions. It's the power structure, essentially. That's what's really, really key here. Um, and this has a long history to it. Uh, as a history uh, of partisan media in the United States is very old. And of course, you had a uh, father, uh, Coughlin, in the 1930s, uh, spreading hate and anti-Semitism uh, through his radio program, uh, which was eventually taken off the air because it was against the democratic norms and the, uh, the norms of a democratic uh, society. Uh, but you have from the 1960s and the 1970s the on, uh, uh, sort of the deregulation, the uh, unmooring of um, media from uh, norms of fairness, of impartiality, uh, of um, um, checking uh, of propaganda and the like. Um, now they, in, in this book, particularly point to the last 30 years or so, uh, and they point to, um, I guess, the period in the early 1990s, uh, when you had a backlash against uh, Bill Clinton's presidency uh, led by Newt Gingrich. Uh, and I went back and looked at a uh, video of Newt Gingrich from this particular time. And here's just a little excerpt from uh, his speech in 1994 uh, discussing the uh, contract with America. This is before the election. We've had the usual carping 
the usual complaining, the usual negativism from an all too cynical Washington press corps which attacks us for term limits for balanced budget amendment. One columnist called our contract an air ball. Now I recognize sadly that the Washington press corps is all too often the Praetorian guard of the left. But Now, the point here that I want to emphasize is that I just took this out at random, but here you have the demonization of uh, the media and uh, the politicization of it, making an accusation which is uh, grossly uh, incorrect. And, um, um, but nevertheless, creating an environment where pol uh, the political... Um, fidelity and the political uh, credibility uh, and um, the political identity of a website or of a news organization came first. That was more important than whether it was a credible organization. So in other words, was it on our side? Is it part of our team? And that is the key here. That's the particular um, politicization, the, the making of truth as partisan that has uh, created this asymmetric um, media ecosystem and uh, the epistemic crisis. Now, uh, this has continued with backlash politics, which is sort of ethno-nationalist against um, uh, or Barack Obama, where you had the emergence of the Tea Party movement uh, in 2009, uh, the, um, the racialized campaign against Obama, um, inventing him as a, an outsider, as an other, as a Kenyan and as not as an American. And then, of course, the long, decade-long campaign against uh, the Clintons, Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton. Um, and this then giving rise to um, Donald Trump. Uh, and that was in part created by the uh, a tremendous amount of money invested by Robert Mercer, a hedge fund billionaire in a Breitbart uh, and in um, um, the emergence of uh, Trump led by Steve Bannon. Now, what are the conclusions here? Well, they conclude at the very end is, of course, is that the internet itself is not to blame. Uh, there is no echo chamber or filter bubble effect that will inexorably take a society with a well-functioning public sphere and turn it into a sh shambles simply because the internet comes to town. So as they point out in the concluding chapter, there's reasons for both optimism and pessimism here. The optimistic point is that um, there is no inevitable wrecking of democracy by the internet or by new technological systems. This is a matter of institutions, it's a matter of regulations, it's a, ma a matter of cultural practices and collective sense making uh, in a society. And we choose as a society how to regulate the public sphere. So that's uh, uh, grounds for optimism in as much as this can be reversed, this can be changed. And the United States has got a lot of robust institutions that are uh, um, faring up reasonably well uh, under uh, assault, um, the assault that they've had over the last uh, number of years, and some would argue decades, and I think they argue decades. But of course, there are reasons for pessimism too, and that is that uh, it is extremely difficult to get out of a situation where one third of the population is caught in a propaganda feedback loop. It's extremely difficult to take on um, structures of power which are deeply embedded in the society, which have reproduced um, their particular partisans and that those partisans are uh, uh, ideologically motivated and are able to um, exercise um, a inordinate influence uh, on the political uh, system to block any kind of uh, strong regulation. So that's where we are right now. Uh, I think the book is a very useful one uh, and I hope that you found it uh, very stimulating and insightful about our current condition. 
Okay, let me stop there. Thank you.